been a long day, huh? <laughs> So we're going to do our best to, to not break the microphone. We're going to do our best to, to make this a little bit more fun. Uh, first, we have to uh, let, let everyone know that our friends on the Parsoid team are doing a lightning talk tomorrow. And I made this awesome silent movie slide, and I don't think Gabriel was as stoked on it as I was, but I think it's really cool. So hopefully he'll dress in gray and pantomime tomorrow. <laughs> So be sure to, to see Gabriel for that. So this is, uh, we're doing a talk today on extending the visual editor. So the, the intended audience for this talk are developers, people who are going to be building new tools like the bold and italic uh, tools for the editor. Except we already have those, so we need new tools. Um, but if you're not a developer, this will give you a really good insight into what it takes to build these tools and we promise we know that it's the end of the day we're going to try to keep it as lively and as fun as possible so um uh the two of us uh, are going to present this is uh this is Ines Kuchensky. um i think i'll introduce him really quick he's uh previously a blue shirt wearer now he's wearing this lovely white uh, uh cloth shirt and he is, uh, he's a pretty good developer, uh, talks about code all the time, even when I don't want him to. And uh, he really loves the Philippines. So that's you next. Look at that guy. <laughs> Hi. Uh, there is not so much interesting to talk about Christian. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe besides the world fact that uh, world record, actually, Guinness recognized a uh, record holder in Chicken McNuggets he said in it within three minutes. Uh, that, that's completely true. So, uh, the two of us work at Wikia. We've worked at Wikia for uh, about six years, and some of you probably know Wikia. Wikia is the biggest place on the internet for fans to go and write original content about the stuff that they love. Uh, you may also know it as the other company that was founded by Jimmy Wells. Uh, we're up to 75 million monthly uniques, and we have over 300,000 communities. And it's the leading collaborative publisher on the web, and we're also doing a lot of stuff with mobile apps now. So if you haven't seen Wikia before, please check us out. So of course, at the core, we run MediaWiki software. And a few years ago, we built uh, a visual editor. It was, it was kind of like uh, an, we used an off-the-shelf HTML editor to get there quick. Uh, but then as you maintain it, you know, as time goes on, it gets a little bit more difficult. So we started looking for a better solution for this. And we, we ended up talking to the guys at the foundation when, right at the beginning when they were starting on visual editors. So we decided to, to join up and work on the project. So Inez and I have been working with the guys for the last couple years on visual editor. So today we're going to talk about adding a new tool to visual editor. And we're going to build it live before your very eyes. And we're going to build a map. So here's Inez to talk to you about building a MediaWiki extension. Uh, yeah, so our extension is going to be called GMAP, which stands uh, for a Google Map, Google Maps. Uh, it's going to be a very simple extension that uh, just let you specify coordinates, uh, with height, zoom, and display the article in the, in the MediaWiki article, a map of certain uh, part of the, of the world. So it's going to be very simple. It's going to live in the extensions GMAP directory, as every other MediaWiki extension usually lives. The important part about it, you notice, is that uh, we are not going to touch the Visual Editor extension. We, we're going to build it completely uh, outside next to Visual Editor extension. Um, it's going to be a parser tag, GMAP. It will get a, a five attributes that I mentioned. And it will render a static map image with a, with a marker pointing to the, to the coordinates you specify. So for instance, for, uh, for this uh, wiki text, as you can see above, we'll, we'll get this, uh, this image uh, showing us a Hong Kong. Um, so let's have a look at how it works now, currently, uh, before we really build a support, a plugin for, for visual editor to support in, it in a better way. So currently, if I go to the edit source, I'll just see a uh, GMAP extension.
extension, the same, the same code. I can modify it, make it a little, a little bit more uh, wider and maybe not so not so as high. And I will I will zoom in a little bit. Then I will show you the view in which you can notice that uh, it really it really works. It really really changed. But I have to I have to do it uh, by editing uh, wiki text, which in Visual Editor I don't want to do. So currently, after this extension is created, it it will already uh, render in the visual editor mode. So now I'll go to the visual editor. So as you can see, uh, the same map is rendered. Uh, just, just if you didn't notice, I didn't actually save the change. I, I made an only show preview, so that's the, that's the same map. Uh, but you cannot, in the visual editor, currently interact with it. You cannot change any properties. If I, if I display my mouse, I just get the information that this is, this is something that is not currently, currently supported. And our goal of this presentation will be to teach you how to build an uh, editor, some form of uh, editing those five, uh, five parameters. Uh, very, very basic. Uh, OK, let's get back to the presentation. So what's pretty cool about that, the, the green lines that you saw, is that right out of the box, even if we haven't built anything specifically for this GMAP, for Visual Editor, Visual Editor still handles it great. It loads the map, it keeps the, the layout of the page exactly the way that it is in view mode. It's just that we haven't yet unlocked this map to let Visual Editor do anything with it. We only have a MediaWiki extension built for it. So, so now we're going to get into building um, an extension. So you saw this in the last presentation. This is an overview of how the entire ecosystem works. It starts with wiki text at the top. It goes through the parsoid to deliver HTML plus RDFA into the visual editor. The visual editor is really the bulk of our talk. Um, when we're done editing, it creates modified HTML plus RDFA, which goes back through another special part of the parsoid, which is called the serializer, and then it transforms back into wiki text. From a visual editor point of view, we always just think of these two parts as, you know, get the thing from the parsoid, give it back to the serializer, but really, both of those are parsoid. So I'll just touch on Parsoid specifics really quick. Um, this is the new bi-directional Parsoid that's written in JavaScript and it runs server-side on Node.js. Uh, it can go out to the MediaWiki API when it needs to. Um, it's able to both uh, load and save the HTML plus RDFA. And this last part is pretty interesting. It gives us HTML, the visual editor receives HTML but we're using it only as a data transport format. We're not taking that HTML and actually rendering it in the browser. We're going to do that with our content editable nodes, and we'll explain why in just a minute. Um, so this is, this is what Parsoid gives us. We, we didn't have to do anything yet um, in the GMAP extension. Parsoid is able to, to recognize that, that it came across a parser tag, and it's going to give us some, some data about that. So it's going to tell us that it's a uh, type of uh, MW extension GMAP. Okay, so that's interesting for us. The other thing that it will tell us uh, is this data MW attribute, and it will give us all the attribute information as JSON. So you can see the latitude, longitude, height, width, and zoom. So Parcel is going to give us all the information that we, that we need. And this is the rest of the surrounding HTML that's delivered. So uh, now we're going to get into some of the specifics of the visual editor starting with the data model. Yes, so uh, Visual Editor is built out of few components, the data model, content editable, and, and UI. And we're going to start talking about, a, I was talking about the data model. Um, and data model, it's a, it's a mirror of the data from parser. So basically when we retrieve uh, HTML, we convert it to, the, to our, our uh, data model in the memory. We keep the same uh, same hierarchy, same structure, so we can navigate between uh, next and previous siblings. We can navigate to, uh, to parents and, and children of a, of a given node. But at the same time, uh, the data model is more something more specified into the HTML, and because of that, it provides us an API for uh, retrieving or setting certain uh, properties and attributes of the of the given uh, data model. In our case, those are the longitude, latitude, etc. Important part about the data model is that it, whenever whenever any of those attributes is changed, it notifies a view about that change, and then view might decide what to want to do with this information. 
in our case, it will be a uh, rendering a uh, different map. If, if, the, if the line the longitude change, we will render the map with a different different uh, part of the, of the world displayed on it. Um, and there is last part about the HTML that is very important, but that's the same one which is responsible for generating HTML back, which goes to the parser. So basically, it takes HTML from the from the parser just for a single single node, uh, provides an API to, to modify some attributes if we if we want to, if user wants to, and then when user is done and clicks save, that's the one that generates the uh, HTML uh, for a single node and send it back to the to the parser. So by that you can you can see how important it is to keep the same uh, hierarchy and the same structure, so we generate exactly exactly same tree. Uh, that's it about data model. Uh, I'll talk now about the uh, content editable. So that's our our view layer. That's the that's the one that is uh, responsible for uh, for render. So uh, I just said that data model M is an event when there is a data change, and view uh, obviously listens to that to that information to to re render. Uh, also, because it's the, it's the view, it's the one that handles interaction. So, in computer science, it's not specifically like an NVC pattern. It wouldn't be just the view. So, it's a, it's a little bit more than that. Um, but that's the one uh, in which you can you can assign a certain uh, certain bindings, certain uh, event handlers. Uh, if you want to react to like clicking on the event node or resizing it, dragging it, things like that. And uh, as over the mention, that's the one that you actually see on the screen. So nothing really complicated. Uh, that covers content editable. And now we'll actually create a data model and content editable uh, node for, for our extension for the GMAP. OK, so this is where we're going to get into unlocking that, that map picture that was in the editor. Uh, you saw before, when you hover on it, you get these green stripes. And it says, we can't do anything with this. So we're going to fix that. So we need two things. We need that data model node, and we need a content editable node. So we're going to start with coding the, the data model node. We have a, we have a skeleton uh, that has the constructor. That's your job. <laughs> we, have a, we have the skeleton that, that, that has the constructor for the, uh, for the uh, data model map node. And then it has some inheritance and some registration that just registers this node. Okay? Uh, so then the next thing that's important to do is add a couple static properties. And the static properties at the bottom uh, give it a name, the symbolic name map. Oh, hold questions again if you can. We're going we're gonna to rip through this and get to everybody's questions. Uh, the, the, the name of this is called GMAP. And that's going to be used with different uh, parts of this plugin to, to know that it's talking about the same thing. Uh, and then also matching RDFA types. So if you remember on the Parsoid slide, I showed that Parsoid is going to deliver us a type of and it's MW extension GMAP. This is where we look for that, and, and this node is going to raise its hand and say, yeah, I'm responsible for that. I'm the guy who's going to take that. Uh, so this is what we do here. Then we have two important methods, and they are uh, two data node. Uh, sorry, two data element. There it is. Um, sorry? Oh, OK. We'll bump it up a little bit. Um, so this two data element. Uh, what this does is it takes the HTML that Parsor gives us, and it needs to translate it into uh, into a data element that, that we're able to use inside the visual editor. This is going to be used for uh, for storing all of the values of latitude, longitude, for example. Uh, so this is what it's doing: it's pulling it from. You can see this line get attribute data MW, and then it's putting it inside this data element uh, as the the MW, and then it's also holding on to original MW. This is for, for later. If something didn't change, then we'll just hand the original MW back to Parsoid. Okay? And then the last method that we need is called two DOM elements. And what this does is it takes the uh, you know the data node, uh, the data model node is responsible for creating that HTML to hand back to Parsoid. So that's what this does. This is for later when we when we want to save the page, we need to hand HTML back to, to Parsoid, and that's what this does. Okay? So once we have that, we have our data model node finished. And now we just need the, the counterpart. We need the content editable node. So it starts again with a, a skeleton very similar to the data model node, uh, which has the, uh, the constructor, the inheritance, and the registration at the end. Okay? And again, we're going to jump into doing some static properties. Again, the name is GMAP, so this will bind these two together. 
Um, and then the, the static tag name div, this is the, the container that it's going to, to use uh, to render. Can you see it on Okay, so after that we need some, some helper methods that, that, we, uh, that we wrote. So we've got two of them here. The top one is called set image URL, and it ends up using the one at the bottom that's called generate image URL. This is once some properties change, we need to request that picture of the map from Google. And that line is toward the bottom here, where it returns the, the Google uh, URL based on the, the attributes that are, that are sent to it. Um, OK, and then we need one more method, and that's on attribute change. Uh, this is what happens when the data model changes, and it needs to notify the view of this content editable node. This is the thing that receives it. So when it gets information from the model that something has changed, what it does is it calls that function set image URL. Set image URL is going to actually you know, set the, the source attribute of the image that's on the screen, and then, uh, and, and then it's going to use the generate image URL to, to actually figure out what that is. Okay. And then the last thing that we need is a, a final setup at the top. And this will, so this is in the constructor. And when the constructor gets run the first time, you see that we have this setup line where it creates what's called this dot dollar image. And that is a, a jQuery uh, representation of that image tag that's in the page. Uh, but we didn't set a source before. We didn't have this helper method set up yet. So now that we explain those, we call set image URL one time. So we end up with an image that has a source, which is pretty important. Otherwise, you have a blank image. So that's it. We have the data model node and the content editable node. And they're both going to, to listen to Parsec when it, when it sends us that data. So let's go to the browser and have a look at it. It's going to be spectacular. OK, so this is the read mode. When we click Edit, we go into Visual Editor. And now when we hover on the, the map, see what happened? There's no green lines. But still, you can't do anything. So <laughs> we're, we're not quite done yet. Um, so. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, okay, let's go back to the, to the presentation. So there's a couple quick things that we can do to get some interactivity in. He has going to talk to us about this. Um, so those, those simple things, uh, quick things that we can do to uh, have some, some better support uh, is using mixings. Uh, mixings are, uh, are something similar to classes, but not exactly. Basically, it lets us add a um, Add a given functionality to uh, whatever CE node we want by just adding adding few lines of code. So, for instance, at this moment we have created a protected node, focusable, resizable, and relocable. What it means that we can very easily make any node resizable if we just add that mixing. The same applies to a focusable, which means that uh, focusable node is the one that you can you can click and it will it will get selected. And for instance, you can display some context menu or some button to interact with it. Uh, relocable node is the one that you can drag from one place to the other, so it, it makes a perfect sense for uh, for images and maybe for uh, for templates, objects like that. And uh, a little bit not obvious one is the protected node. Uh, that's the node which uh, which renders some kind of a complex structure, for instance, image and, uh, and a paragraph of a text, such as an uh, image and a caption. So we don't want the user to go directly into, into the caption. Uh, when the user tries to do that, we want to we want to protect. Uh, cursor from ending up in that in that place, so we make entire node to protect that. Um, what we're going to do with uh, with our node, we are going to make it only protected and, and focusable, and we'll see we'll show you how how quick it is and what it really does. So let's get back to our editor, and this is only the view layer, so we're going to apply the changes in a um, in a CE in our view layer, and we'll add uh, two mixes. Protected and focusable. Uh, that's the in the in the, mix, uh, in the definition and also in the constructor. Uh, so basically, four lines of code, and now we can go to the browser and, and see what changed. So we still see it render, but now it actually uh, gives you some highlights when you when you uh, hover over it, and you can click it. You can click it, it selects, and, and that's that's a big step forward because now we can uh, this action of selecting it, uh, we can uh, we can link different actions that we'll show you just in a second. Also, important part is that now uh, you can actually not only click it but cursor when you are cursoring to the left or to the right, it will it will stop over this node, 
and will select it, and then it will go, go forward. So it's very, very important and very user friendly for people which likes to use a keyboard over the, over the mouse, and there's quite, quite a lot. Um, okay. Um, so now we will go uh, and talk about what really, really matters and, and our, our final goal, which is actually editing the, those properties. Christian is going to talk about Okay, so the last bit of magic in the visual editor is the interface. So, so far we have it so it's no longer having those broken green stripes. Now we have it rendering without that. We have it protected and focusable so you can click on it. And then the next step is actually being able to do something with it. So we have some uh, pre-built uh, UI components. Uh, one that you'll see quite a bit are dialogues. This will open a modal you know, on top of the, the, the interface. And this is done for you know, kind of larger, more complex work. Uh, we also have inspectors. This is really nice. If you highlight some text and you want to make a link, you just need to provide a little bit of metadata, just where the link goes. And instead of opening a big dialogue, we can just do it in this nice inspector. And then dialogues and inspectors will use these widgets that we've created. These are things like drop-down menus and fields and buttons with different hover states and active states, um, different you know cancel and submit button styles. And these are these are pretty easy to use in the code. You'll see them in just a minute. Uh, and that minute is here. So let's uh, let's code this thing. Okay, so we'll start uh, with creating a button. Okay, so now we have this node uh, selectable. Uh, when users select it, we want to display some uh, some sort of button that, after after being clicked, will open a, a dialog in which user will be able to modify the parameters. So button is very simple. Uh, Christian just added a code for it. It's very similar to every other code we so far created. Just a simple constructor, inheritance, and and here is the registration. Uh, however, we have to define what this button, uh, when this button is going to be displayed. There is, we have also a helper for that. Here in the model class property, static property, you can see uh, it, it uh, refers to the VEBN GMAP node. And that's the model of our node. So uh, we have a different automatically when uh, GMAP node is selected. It will know which button is displayed. So it's very, very handy, very, very uh, user friendly because you don't have to really handle any low level JavaScript uh, on click or anything like that. It's a visual editor does it, does it for you. Um, there is other important uh, property such as icon. So we just uh, use the map uh, as, a, as a symbolic symbolic link to the icon that will be displayed in the, in the button. As you will see later in the visual editor, we very often use some, some sort of symbolic names to, to reference uh, different things. It's, it's very, very, uh, very good when it comes to the extensibility of the editor because uh, things are not hard, uh, connected based on the, on the types, but very often on the, on the keywords which can be overwritten easily. Um, so we'll show you how it works now, so that's right, creating that one file. Yay, you get, a, you get a, this little nice button. That's our map icon there. Uh, you, can, you can click it and then nothing happens. <laughs> uh, yeah, nothing happens because we still don't have a dialogue. Uh, but now we're gonna create a dialogue. It's very similar. It's a, it's a constructor, simple inheritance. Uh, but here we actually will do a, a little bit more. We will uh, define. Uh, we will define uh, what are the properties you, uh, we will let user add it, and and uh, what basically will be the user user experience, user interaction. Uh, so we'll start with also specifying some icon and some title message. So it, it, when it's going to be displayed, it will look nice. Uh, basically, we'll have some icon and, and title, so user will be not, uh, will be aware of what user is doing, and that's in general pretty good practice. Um, so uh, we will start with the initialize method, and the initialize method uh, is the one that sets up the frame of the dialog. It's called only one time for for given dialog type. So it's not the one that actually fills the uh, input box we're gonna create with the data. It's the one that sets up the input boxes. Uh, so we're gonna start with uh, just showing you how to create the one input box for the latitude. That's a simple text input widget and input label widget. Those two are connected, and and we will create the same for uh, for another remaining fields. So for the 
longitude with height and zoom. Yeah, that's that's basically a uh, very similar similar code. Uh, there's probably a better way to create that, uh, more in some sort of loop, but for the simplicity of this presentation, we just uh, wanted to keep it as simple uh, as possible. Uh, also, we created an apply button. That's the button which uh, will appear in the dialog. You can click it after you are done with uh, editing parameters. And the dialog will disappear, and the change you made is going to be applied by a tra transaction. Um, this last part is actually appending those jQuery elements to the uh, to our display, to our our dialog. Uh, and now, now we'll go to the method on all. So the only initialize that we just discussed uh, is called only only once per given dialog per given uh, instance of the editor. But then on open method is the one that is called uh, every time. This, this dialog is open for any different node of this specific type. So if we have few maps, uh, the uh, on open is going to be called few times uh, when, when that node is, uh, is open in the dialog. So uh, we don't, we are not going to do here too much. We basically retrieve what is the selected uh, node, and we read its attributes, and we rewrite those attributes to, to our inputs by calling the set value method. Five attributes, five calls to set value. Um, and at this moment, uh, we will have a display. So uh, when the dialog opens, it will be filled with all the all the values. And the last remaining piece is actually saving the, the information after after it changes. So that's the on close method. Uh, on close method, uh, instead of calling set value, it calls get value. Uh, so it retrieves the values from the inputs and create a create a structure that's similar to the original structure, actually exactly the same the original structure and processes transaction uh, against the surface surface model. Uh, so what happens here is, is all the data that user modified is, is basically serialized, it's processed as a, as a transaction, uh, data, specific data model is notified about it, then it not notifies the view and, and we'll see the node uh, re-render it. Uh, so we can, we can show you now how it works. And this time it will be really some fun. So uh, Christian is modifying a few values. Um, when he will click apply changes, you will see that the thing in the background really, really is changing. Right? So uh, we used here very, very simple interfaces. Are just input boxes, uh, nothing really impressive. Very generic, but in fact, you could build here uh, some location selector or location picker with using like, actually JavaScript, Google Maps, some uh, zooming with a, with a scroll, some drag and drop, or uh, to, to set the size of the map. I just wanted to show you like the basic basic version uh, that you can extend if, if you're interested in, and you're very welcome to. Uh, okay, so at this moment, we we uh, we know how to how to uh, create an editor for a given element. But it's still, uh, now let's, say, let's see if that's gonna say correctly. So here, uh, we are going to just display the div of our change. And you should be able to see that the two parameters do not modify, the height and zoom and width, uh, so three actually, uh, are there. And, and the div is very clean, as, as you see, only only the three param parameters were modified, nothing else. And that's actually thanks to partial control editor, but also in a big part to uh, to the parsoid. And Christian is going to talk about the serializer a little bit, or actually, I'll wait. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so uh, serializer, as I said before, is a is a part of the parsoid. It's a, it's a, it's the same project. It's a parsoid. Is, uh, Bidirectional. Uh, it gets the HTML plus RDFA from us, and it's serialized back to the uh, to the wiki text. And it has kind of have it in mind to uh, don't don't break anything. So uh, and in order to don't break anything, I mean don't make uh, dirty divs, uh, divs containing something that the user did not intend to change, because that creates a problem uh, while reviewing the change, because uh, the reviewer doesn't understand uh, what's going on there. Then when the reviewer approaches user and talks about those, those, those changes in the div, user is not even aware of those. So that was very important for us to, uh, to avoid. And, and um, 
feature of the parser used to do that is called selective serialization. So it's a smart mechanism that basically detects if uh, parameters of the given node, for instance, of the GMAP node, change. And if they change, it really uh, creates the wiki text from scratch for that node. But if those attributes didn't change, if it's the, the same values, user didn't interact with that node, it reuses the original wiki text. So whatever, whatever was the order of parameters, if there were some inline comments in the like HTML style comments, or whatever was the num number of empty lines or like white spaces, it's going to be preserved because it's going to reuse the exactly original uh, wiki text, which I think is very good. That covers the serializer. So the last thing uh, is actually to deploy our extension, but we have to create a, some sort of a package for us. Right, so now that this whole thing works, we gotta wrap this thing up. And the way that we've done it at Wikia in our current editor is, it's pretty nasty. You have to dive into the kind of core editor and extend it there, and it's uh, it's not very good. So what what this is is it's completely a plugin model. So you go back to your own extension, back to your GMAP extension in this case, and add all of your data model, content editable, and UI files, uh, your style sheets, your icons. Just put it all there. Um, then you include uh, Visual Editor and your extension, in this case GMAP, in your local settings. And then you'll create a resource loader module for all of your assets for your for your plugin, and then you will uh, you'll register those uh, those assets uh, with the visual editor. That way, when someone clicks edit and visual editor code loads, your plugin will load as well. Okay, it's pretty easy. Yeah. Um, so all we'll be able today is already actually on GitHub. Uh, so you are very welcome to download it, play with it, contribute. Also this presentation, if you didn't, didn't catch something, it's also available at the same link uh, on the GitHub. You're just very, very welcome to fire, file a pull request and, and improve or just learn from that if you want to build some extensions for or plugins for different, uh, different extensions of the, of the media wiki that currently exists. And at the end, let me tell you a little bit what is going on. At Wikia, with the with the visual editor. Uh, so currently at Wikia, we are working on our own plugins uh, to support photos, uh, videos, and galleries. So user will be able to add those to the to the article. Uh, the interesting part about it is that at the same time we are adding support with the visual editor, but we are completely redesigning the flow of uh, how those things work. So so up to up to now, usually user in the also all sorts of the editors had to choose what kind of medium uh, is uh, is to be added up front. So if you want to add image, if you was choosing uh, add image option or add video. And we want to reverse the experience. First you decide that you want to add, a, add a any media, and then we want to provide you as good experience as possible with exploring what is actually on that wiki already. Uh, and then when you find it that that what you like most is actually a video, then you can select the video. If you like the, the image better, then you select the image. Or if you cannot decide and you like both, then you select both and the gallery will be created. So uh, so it's very, very cool because you don't have to go first to the images and then you find out that you cannot make up your mind and then you cancel and go to the gallery and make the same search query. Uh, we are very, very excited about this change. And we are going to release it in, in this year, in November. Uh, and that will be 300,000 uh, different wikis, so it's going to be a pretty, pretty big release. Um, that's, that's it when it comes to our, our plans. And now, if you have some questions, we'll be very, very happy to hear them. There will be actually a giveaway uh, for the best question, the, the t-shirt I was wearing previously. <laughs> <laughs> about either one of these talks, anything about visual editor, anything for Parsoid, it would be best to grab the Parsoid team tomorrow at that lightning talk at 11.30. Take it away.
So uh, for the stuff that we couldn't edit, there's wiki text, um, and can we pop that up and edit it? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So we have yeah. yeah so we have something a work in progress at the moment, which will uh, so for stuff where you have like an open tag and some content and a closed tag, like uh, math nodes and higher nodes and uh, like easy timeline. We're building like a general thing that will let you do exactly that, and that, so that should be coming pretty shortly. Um, as you saw in like the GMAP thing, um, all of the information there is stored in attributes. So I mean, we can also make a generic editor for just editing those attributes. So yeah, we can do generic stuff, but what we'd really like to do is, you know, make stuff properly visual editable. So you know, when we have maths editors, it pops up, and you can actually, you know, type in the, you know, insert uh, fraction, you know. So yeah, yeah. we are working on uh, nicer crystal fallbacks. I should also mention that while well, for the extension tags, it's really, really cleanly possible to map the wiki text back to the back to the thing, uh, or the thing back to the wiki text. That's not always the case. All right. Any other questions? What's the uncompressed code size? What is the uncompressed code size? Um, I think it's something like 500 kilobytes. <laughs> James, how much is it? It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, so to cheat and to count things like image files, but those come down to your, your bandwidth as well, is um, like 1.4 megs at this point. Um, obviously, it's incredibly compressed by the time it gets sent to a user and is cached, so uh, the actual impact on people's bandwidth is significantly smaller than that, but yeah, it's not trivial. There are also loads of comments, because they're really good like that, but we'll throw those all away when we minify. Yeah, so the uncompressed one has lots of space, but once it's compressed, once we throw away the comments and things like that, it gets more than you do. And geez, it, yeah. Yeah, so the compressed minified version, if I recall correctly, is something like 300 or 350k. Okay. Plus the images, yes. Oh, the size of big image, yeah. It's about the size of a high quality picture on the top of the red box. Alright, who else? Who else? So the question was, um, the question was, is it cached, um, or does it have to load again every time you add a new page? So your browser actually caches the caches the JavaScript that we load. That's a general thing that browsers do. Um, so if you edit a page for the second time in the same browser, it'll already have the code. Um, it's additionally cached in layers up, but that still requires it to come down to your bandwidth. So, but it should be, it should be there if you're adding for a second time on the same. Yeah, on the same wiki, on the same computer, and same browser, and same. Uh, so uh, the extension stuff, or which, uh, which, uh, can you do that from gadgets and user scripts as well, or is it added extension? So the question was, uh, the extension stuff that Inez and Christian showed um, for visual editor, can you also do that from gadgets and user scripts? And the answer is yes. Um, you can definitely do that from gadgets and user scripts. Um, I need to actually get around to writing documentation for how you do it, <laughs> but um, which I was going to do on the plane right over here, but then it's... Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's reasonably easy to, um, you basically write all the stuff that they write the same way, and then it's just a packaging bit that's different. And there is a fairly easy, possibly easier than for extensions, um, packaging thing that you need to do with you do. Uh, have you thought already about which features are needed for system projects? Um, will you be working on that? So the question was, have we already talked about which features are needed for sister projects, and when we'll be working on that, and I think that's something that James mentioned better. So, um, yes and no. So, uh, we know some sister projects quite well, we know what extensions they have, but they're important, and some of them make us cry. Most notably, Wikisource is very dependent on a um, proofread page, which puts a side-by-side -side, uh, uh, picture, the, the page you're editing, and an editable box. This is quite a lot of work for us to do in Visual Editor, so we're going to prepare to build an integration with Visual Editor that will work for Wikisource uh, like that. For other um, Wikis, however, we don't actually know very well what the extensions are that we need to support, and that's another thing where we really value people's input as to the, by the way, I edit on Wikinews, and this particular extension is incredibly important, or on Wikiversity, or on Wikivolge, things like that, and we really value people saying, by the way, yes, this is installed, but no one uses it, so don't prioritize that over getting us visual editors to try out in the first place. Questions? No questions? Okay. Yeah, just one question. In passing, you mentioned that the caption of images is a type of editing. Yeah, uh, that's, um, 
so the question was, uh, Inez mentioned in passing that the caption of images is protected from direct editing. Um, so the reason for that is that uh, you don't want people to click inside the box which has an image and an icon and the word, this is a caption, and delete the image but leave the box and the icon because that's not something you can actually create in wiki text. Um, or delete the icon, or actually you can get rid of the icon, it, never mind. Anyway, um, so one of the things we have to do is make sure that the user always has a page that they can press save and it works. Right. Um, and so we have to stop them from being able to edit certain things that Wikitext doesn't let you edit. So you, well you could like, click on that edit caption and get extra notes. Yeah, so you could click, as, as you said, the, you could click into the image and then edit the caption and eventually also the alt setting and the left, right, up, down, all those settings for images. Um, I just want to add to that that part of what, what you mentioned, so clicking directly in the, on the, in the caption of policy cursor there and editing, is, is a user experience that we probably would like at some point, uh, but the user interaction is, is a little bit difficult to design because sometimes when you click on the on the image, on this caption, it's hard to tell if you want to place a cursor there or you want to select the entire object and then hit uh, delete to delete it. Or maybe you are clicking because you want to drag it to the different place. So, so basically, user, besides the technical problem, there is a problem of uh, user interaction. And also, to make it consistent with all sorts of different nodes. So if we, if we take an approach as for everything that is not a text, we, we handle it in a dialogue. That might be not the perfect solution for all types of nodes, but at least it brings us consistent. Founded out that the rationale for protecting it is very similar to a template. Like a template generates an info box that has a label. You can't click on the label because it's part of the uh, part of the template. And similar thumbnails have little icons, tooltips, like a border, which is protected from direct editing. Uh, yeah, you're right. And the, having dialogues with sort of massive tables is going to be a, not a very nice user experience. And being able to click directly into say template of the things that we know are just generated by inserting text would be a good user interface and that's something we're trying to work out to do but it's going to require some help from our friends at Parsoid. So you know, but that's, yeah, that, that would be a, a much better user interface. Anything else? Who else is on the team? Who else is on the team? Um, we have another value team member named Rob, who is um, at the hotel with food poisoning, unfortunately. Um, after already after recovering from breaking his foot earlier uh, this year, so he's not he's not getting a lot of luck. Um, apart from Rob, we have yes. Apart from Rob, we also have uh, Trevor, who's the lead engineer on this team, but he decided to stay home because his wife is very pregnant. Um, I think that's a good excuse. Yeah. Um, uh, in addition to that, we have um, the Carso team um, of whom only Gabriel is here, and he is back there. Um, and in addition to Gabriel, we have three other engineers in the Carso team um, who are in various locations across the world, and I can never keep, keep my mind straight as to where they all are. Um, and on top of that, we have uh, three Google Summer of Code students that intern with this team. We have um, a bunch of, we get a bunch of help from people in other parts of the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, for like community liaison stuff and product support. And I, there is a mail list close by me out there somewhere that lists like 25 people that are involved in this project. We also have two more from Wikia, Trevor, our product manager, and Earl, our interaction designer. And also, let's not forget all of you who I'm hoping will uh, pull down our GMAP plugin and start exploring. <laughs> and you heard that right, we have two Trevors because we believe in not making things confusing. Mm -hmm.